Yep. Live and in color. The good thing is they're supposed to rain. Mostly. All right, we're already rain. We're rolling. Yep, we're rolling. All right, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the late start. See, we've got some uh, familiar faces from last time. My name's John Sammons. I haven't changed since yesterday. It looks like most of you guys uh, haven't either. <laughs> so, uh, welcome back for the morning session. Um, Going to change up the talk a little bit. Instead of doing the uh, the basic kind of introduction to digital forensics, I had I had originally thought about doing. I want to do this. I want to do the keys to forensic success examination planning. Okay, this is something I think that doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of talk or a lot of a lot of coverage. Actually, too many times I think in a lot of trainings that we go to, uh, focus is, is a lot of times on the technology and a lot of times on the tools, and that's great and that's absolutely necessary. But I think we need to get also. Uh, spend some time thinking about the process itself and try to improve the most important forensic tool, and that's us, all right, and our approach to the actual evidence. So a lot of times we go to training by all these vendors, we talk to a lot of folks that, that, that make the tools, that teach us how to use the tools, but our process is what is ultimately is the most important part of this, okay, to make this whole thing work for everybody. So we've got to start thinking about the process in a little more detailed and more nuanced way. So what, what we've got to start with, and where we often fail here is we got to start with a plan, all right? I'm guilty of this. I, I would dare say we we're all guilty of this where we get a case in the lab, hits the door, and what do we do? We process it, bring it up in the FTK or in case or whatever we're going to use, and we start doing what? We start to look around, right? We do all that. That's just what we do because we're, we've got, how many of you guys have a backlog? Anybody? I guess probably most of, I just have to imagine everybody's probably got more to do than they can get done. How many of you guys have got all the people you need? That's what I thought. How I many you guys got all the money you, that you actually need? That's what I thought. So what this planning does, and what I'm trying to hopefully help you guys get to is to be able to work smarter with the limited resources that we all have to deal with. So this plan is something that is very, very important. All right, so let me ask you a quick, I know this is early, but a quick quiz here. All right, what is the goal of a forensic examination? Is it to be thorough or is it to be appropriate? Thorough? Thorough, thorough. Anybody disagree? All right, you're wrong. That's right, I'm wrong. That's, that's a wrong check. It's actually this. My bad. <laughs> it's actually the appropriate. Why is that? What does thorough mean to you? Exhaustive. Exhaustive. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? Exhaustive. How many of you guys have time to go through every every cluster of a three terabyte drive? Again, no hands. Probably not. All right, we don't have time. We simply don't have time to go through. Now, some cases may necessitate that, right? But you may get a you know a garden variety ground ball case that's run of the mill that you really don't need that to get the job done. So the objective here is to do an appropriate examination, not a necessarily a thorough one, because you don't need to go through every bite and every cluster on that piece of media. All right, we just don't have the resources. We're going to be wasting time and money that we really don't have by trying to be thorough and exhaustive, if you will, all right, when we just don't need to do it, and we just, in, in the real world, can't, all right, you just can't do it. All right, real quick review here, just to also re refresh our recollection a little bit from yesterday, and then set, set the stage for the rest of what we're going to discuss, the four phases, collection, examination, analysis, and reporting. Collection, examination, analysis, and reporting, all right, we'll go through those just a little bit. The collection phase, we we run through this a little bit. What are we talking about here? The data in question is identified, labeled, recorded, all right, and acquired, all right, from all the possible sources. Again, that's one of those things we talked about yesterday that's, that can be a struggle, especially when we're talking about email investigations or things using the cloud or involving a network, where that evidence actually lives can be a struggle to identify all possible sources of it. Separate devices, mobile devices, if you've got, um, Again, multiple locations that are spread across, you know, that are geographically spread spread out can be a challenge. Still got to maintain that integrity of the evidence, no matter what we're doing. We've always got to maintain the integrity of the evidence. Moving on to the examination phase. The examination phase, because examination and analysis are not the same things. You may, you may think that there, there's a, a, a nuance there, a little bit of a difference. So when we're talking about examination, all right, 
extracting that data and putting it into a condition where an analysis can happen. All right, so in a lot of bigger labs, you will see you have examiners and analysts. All right, so the examiners are going to, you know, process the evidence, put it into the software, expand it, uh, decrypt it if possible, et cetera, et cetera, get that into a condition to where somebody can actually look at it and analyze it. So the analysis, all right, to analyze that extracted data using well-documented methods and techniques we've talked about. And then we want to then we want to start answering the questions that started the case. I'll we'll start to answer those questions, and questions later on in the talk are going to be what we're what, the, what this is really all about. Last but not least, and where this doesn't get enough uh, enough coverage really either, is the reporting part. Is the reporting part because a lot of folks, you didn't go to school, you didn't take this job to what to really stand up there and write giant long reports. You guys got into it for the technology and the investigative aspects of it, perhaps. But who are the ultimate customers? Who are the people that use what we deliver? Are they are they highly technical? No, they're not. How many guys will run? Let's say I mean, hope uh, this is. How many guys actually will run? Let's say the default FTK report, and that's what you deliver to your client, your customer. Hopefully, that's not the case. Good. All right. Good. Too too often that is the case. What happens if you would take that default FTK report and hand that over to an investigator, a lawyer, a CEO, your boss? What's going to happen to them? Their eyes are going to roll back in their head, and they're going to go, I have no idea what that is. And that you have, you are totally, you know, that is just not, not going to work, right? Not going to work. So they've got to be detailed, but they've got to be readable. That, that data and that information has got to be accessible to the end user. Got to be accessible to the end user. So these reports typically have got to say what you did, what you did it with, all right, and the conclusion that you were able to draw, all right, from your analysis, all right? I mentioned a minute ago about questions. It is literally all about the questions, and that, that's what we need to start with, that's what we need to end with, and that is what is going to drive, that's going to drive our examination and this examination plan. Okay, that's what it's all about. So the questions, again, are going to drive everything that we're going to do. So, the evidence, okay, has got to answer a wide array of questions from different perspectives, different contexts, right? Who are some of the people that are involved with this evidence that, are going to, that may ask a different kind of question? Do you guys have a, have a guess, maybe? Depends on the investigation. Okay, depends on the investigation. All right, good. I might say, let's, let's use a criminal context just, just for discussion's sake. So you may have investigators. You're going to be asking investigative type questions of that evidence, all right? All right? Forensic practitioners, all right, are going to ask technical and forensic type questions, right? Who might be the last, the last one you think? Lawyers. Lawyers. And they're going to ask what kind of question? Legal. Right? <laughs> yeah, wrong ones, right? All right? So the, investiga the investigators want to know the basic stuff, the who, what, why, where, when, and how, right? All right? Lawyers are going to ask the legal questions that depend on what, the statute or the law, okay, and these things can be not the same things at all, all right, so what we might be looking for is going to be totally different than what the lawyer may need, all right, so the more clearly that these questions and these answers are stated up front, all right, the more effective and efficient this examination is going to be, all right, because here's, here's the biggest challenge we've got, is we start these cases, what we've got to be able to deal with is the sheer volume of data we're talking about, all right, we don't have the time, we don't have the people, and we don't have the money to deal with an exhaustive examination of every device and every piece of media that comes through our door. All right, um, so we really got to, you know, we really got to start working on this from the front end. We also, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you're done? Are you going too far? Are you not going far enough? How do we really know when you're done? That's what. These examination plan, these, these big questions can help us determine. How do you know when to stop, when you've gone enough, you've gone far enough? All right? So how often are these questions stated clearly up front? Almost probably uh, very rarely, really, very rarely. Because part of the problem is we do our thing, they do their thing, and we sort of meet in the middle and we just sort of work it out, right? But what would happen in a perfect world if both sides kind of talked, got together, and we were able to come up with a plan and come up with an understanding because they really don't know in a lot of, a lot of instances how that they could help us help them. 
because there's a, a lot of times they really don't understand what it is that we do and how we can help them, so we've got to walk them through that process. So I'd like to get a little discussion here in a second. Um, when you guys, when a uh, case comes through your door, what kind of documentation comes with it? I'd like to hear from you guys a little bit on what, on what you guys typically see for grants. Be already included before, or what you start? What 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 you get from a from a customer or whoever's going to give you the tasking? Who's going to bring that to you and they give you a piece of evidence? And what kind of documentation do you get to help guide you on that examination? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Anybody else? Get nothing. Nothing. Anybody else get anything? You get anything? Just chain of custody. Chain of custody. All right. Box, right? You have a little brief discussion about hey, uh, this is what I'm after. I'm looking for this file or that, or I think this guy's doing X. Once, once we get a chance, the evidence in it's to the customer, and you clearly say, what's your objective you want to answer from this? And then at your starting point, if something comes up later on, you go back to them. Let them know roughly what you have in the middle and see if it changes their questions for additional ones. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, I can tell you from experience here, all right, in the criminal lab, what you're going to typically get, you'll get a case submission report, which is a line or two, some blanks of the basic who they are, or their contact information, what this piece of evidence or the pieces of evidence are, with some detailed descriptions, serial numbers, etc., that kind of thing, and then maybe a one line of what, what that's what they're after, right? Then you may get a search warrant, which typically the affidavit of that is going to be the most descriptive uh, document that you get as far as describing the crime, all right, to, to put this into context, all right? Rarely do you get investigative reports, all right? Rarely, if ever. All right, so when that thing hits the door, okay, what we're talking about here is basically that that's a tasking. They're, they're tasking us with this request for an examination. So what exactly are they, um, what do they want us to do? All right, what do they want us to do? So ideally, in a perfect world, all right, this examination request should at least answer the examination or the investigative questions. All right, ideally, this tasking should at least answer those. But again, how often does that happen? Rarely. Rarely, rarely. All right. So you've got to not be bashful. You have to not be bashful about, <clears throat> you know, if you don't have the information that you need. Excuse me one second. I wet my whistle. Um, if you don't have the information, you got to ask. You have to ask. Don't be bashful about it. And I heard this a minute ago. you got to talk. Typically, you've got, you know, three stakeholders in this whole thing. You might have you lawyers and an investigator, okay, but you typically have got more than one person involved as a stakeholder in this process. Got to be some discussion. There needs to be some discussion, and that needs to be back and forth. Too often it's one way, all right, but they need to be, a, you know, other folks need to be willing participants of that, all right? So, things we need to be talking about. What information is needed from this evidence, all right? Why do they need it, all right? Why is this question important? Why do we need to know the why? How many times have you guys gotten into this, into a piece of evidence and seen something that may be interesting, but you just don't know? So what happened, by no understanding the why, all right, we when we run across other things as we're doing our in the conduct of our examination and analysis, we can find other things they might they may not have been thinking about. So we can, we can recognize relevant evidence, right? We can recognize that relevant evidence. If we don't know the why, we will just blow right by, right? So when we know the why, all right, that's going to be extremely helpful. <clears throat> how is this going to be used? Okay, how, what's the ultimate, how is this evidence going to be used in the end? What's our results going to be used for? What's scope creep? Man? Keep adding more stuff. Keep adding more stuff. I need you to find X. Well, okay, that's cool. I need you to find you know, Y and Z. And then it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing, right? And it keeps getting more cumbersome and more cumbersome and more cumbersome. So you've got to be aware of this scope creep. All right, let's put this in context just a little bit. And I'm going to read, we've got a little bit of a, a scenario to read for you here. And we're going to use this to guide us through kind of the rest of the talk. So bear with me here just a minute. All right, so John Doe is an employee of XYZ Corporation. As an employee, he travels for business, all right, and is reimbursed by XYZ for his expenses. He is requested by the company and the company policy to submit a travel voucher, all right, with original receipts to the company to be reimbursed for that travel. 
Doe is suspected of submitting fraudulent travel claims between January 1, 2015 and the present utilizing altered receipts. There are indications that Doe takes his original receipts, scans them in, all right, then uses Photoshop to increase the amount that he's supposed to be paid. All right. The evidence submitted for this examination is Doe's company-owned desktop computer. An examination is requested to locate any files or data associated with travel claims, vouchers, receipts, and travel documents on this computer. Okay, so that's, that's the facts and circumstances we're going to be working with. So what we need to do is come up with some hypotheses. We need to come up with some hypotheses to help guide us, okay? Just like we had those questions, we had investigative questions, we had legal questions, we had forensic questions, we're going to have the same kind of hypotheses, all right? So let's look at this from the investigative side first. So we have some investigative hypotheses, all right? John Doe utilized his, his computer to submit those travel vouchers, all right? That's what we're hypothesizing here, the who, where, and the what, all right? He did so between January 1, 2015 and the present. That's our win. He used Photoshop to alter those original receipts. Those are high, all right? He did so to obtain additional money, okay? Sounds reasonable, right? Logical, makes sense, all right? So now let's look at it from the legal side a second, our legal hypothesis here, all right? John Doe is an employee of XYZ Corporation. John Doe performed authorized travel for the corporation. John Doe was authorized to be reimbursed for his travel expenses. John Doe was aware of the company's travel policies, including the need to submit original receipts for expenses. John Doe knowingly and willfully altered Original receipts increased their value, submitted them to the company, and received compensation for which to which he was entitled. Okay. So what what basically what, what what do all those represent from the legal side? Does that sound familiar, anybody? These are like elements of the crime, right? These are, these are statutory requirements. Things need to be proven in court. All right. So from their perspective, these are the elements of the criminal offense. I'm going to guess it can be embezzlement. All right, for example, so that's why the need for embezzlement, basically you're converting company assets for your own personal gain. So here we've got to prove they're to be charged with embezzlement, you've got to be an, a, an employee of the company, for example. So there's the evidence, the elements of that crime. All right, so now let's look at the, the forensic hypotheses. All right, let's look at the forensic hypotheses here. All right. XYZ Corporation travel vouchers are going to be found on the suspect's computer. Receipts supporting these vouchers are going to be found on the suspect's computer. Original unaltered receipts will be found on the suspect's computer. Receipts showing alteration will be found on the suspect's computer. Software capable of, original, of altering these original receipts is going to be found on the suspect's computer. And there's going to be indications that such software was used to alter original receipts, okay, uh, will be located on the suspect's computer, okay? Let's go back here just a second and do a little brainstorming on this, all right? So if this, if this case hits your door, let's talk about the, our actual strategy here. How would we go about to find this? What would you do? Search the drive. Search the drive how? I want, to, I want to get down in the weeds a little bit, kind of talk through this. How would you... Where would you go in, your, in the tool of your choice? How would you do it? Well, we have a e discovery tool. Say again? E discovery tool. All right, so you, you've got, I'd say, an EO1 file and you bring it into to that tool or whatever, and how would you do, how would you do that? So uh, what, what tool do you use? Uh, well, we use a, it's called Parika, it's an e discovery, B discovery tool. Uh, that we actually don't even need to have the computer or file that's going to be computer. We can do it from a central management console. So we can search for um, all image formats on the specific computer. Um, if we knew the specific vouchers and what they needed to upload to the tool set, then we could search for that specific. Image all right, so, file. so you're looking for file types? 
new file types, yeah. I mean, assuming that how the travel voucher, it depends on the travel voucher application. Right. You would assume that it would be in the format to be able to take in the voucher, but it couldn't be. It could just be a PDF. You could have screenshot it something, right? Right. So I wouldn't even start there, actually. Okay. You want, you want to walk through what you do? I would start as getting a, a, a I would look at all programs installed on the computer. Okay, and what, and what would that show you? Any image, uh, image creation or modification tool. So I don't really care about finding the vouchers as much on there as altered vouchers. Okay. All right, anybody else? So the second, after you made a copy of the original and then make a copy of the copy, it's not working on both. Load it in the case and you could either store by date and all the files would then uh, show up in there with the modified date of January 1st. Um, look for it if you set file types. Uh, and once you have, you got an MFD, you could throw it into easy work software and create a timeline. And as you can see, anything was altered after that time frame. And that would give you file names to go from there. Okay. All right, good. Go ahead. Online software to edit it. Why would you want to buy Photoshop, and why would you work on it even on that? I'd see if he owned like a netbook or some other computer because nobody would want to. You know, why would you use your work computer? I'd use something else. Print out the receipt, and then I would rescan my printed document that I built on another computer into my original computer. So that way it would actually look like an original document, but it's altered, and you'd lose a lot of the traces of whatever you Photoshop from the print. So, so you wouldn't examine the, the original that they gave you? I would. Yeah, yeah, I think you're... We would, we would have probably pulled web logs, though. Definitely it's part, of, part of our standard operating procedure. I'd grab it your cell phone. That's when pictures are probably taken. Yeah, yeah, might be. Depends on some personal work. If it's personal, yeah. you're probably not going to touch it. If it's work, then you can get it free grade. Work. Depending on the policies. Or any emails yeah. coming in. Email 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 okay. So if you use your permit <coughs> for work, doesn't it then become discoverable? Depends on the state and the policy. Yeah. Do you guys hear how many different right? See the different ways you got different angles, different ways, different methods, different tools, all these things. That's why I think this examination planning up front is gonna help save you get it to be more efficient, more effective. Any more, you know, thorough is probably not the right word, but more effective maybe because you're starting to <clears throat> too often, and this happens. I see this all the time at school with students is they want to jump right into the tool and start to work. They don't want to think before they do it. They don't want to put it in the work ahead of time before they launch. They want to just get it done. And I thought we all fall in that trap, really. And we all get something to do. We've all got way more to do than we can get done. So what do we do? We want to get in there in the tool and get it going. But I think we need to pause a second, breathe, and think about this a minute, and go at it methodically. And then the other thing about being, you know, the, what hopefully on the forensic side of things is what makes us a little different than the average IT people is we're a little more um, have that investigative investigative mindset. We've got to be cognizant and conscious and aware of bias. It's another problem, right? So we may have this bias. You may think, well, I wouldn't do it that way because that's just stupid, right? But you can't overestimate the the, the ignorance of the indigenous North American criminal, right, or whatever. People do stupid stuff. That's why we have jobs. We we catch them all the time, right? If they were remotely sophisticated, we have a heck of a time trying to do what we do. So thankfully, most of them don't have a degree of uh, sophistication. So <clears throat> we've got to also get in the mindset of being methodical. And that's where we, that's where things get missed and mistakes get made. Is we don't put in the the thinking part up front. Is we can just start to go down rabbit holes and start going down things that we really didn't really didn't need to do. So if we think that through, is that really going to be the most productive? What I think you need to approach it from what is the most likely path that's going to produce results up front, right? If you think about it, because your time is extremely valuable, you've got more to do than you can get done, so what is the most likely avenue to find evidence, right? And then also, what is something that we've got to be able to, to check just because, you know, if this goes forward, if we don't check it, what's going to happen? You know, that's going to, that's going to be a huge problem down the road if we've ignored some reasonable, rational, you know, path of process or location, ignored that, that can be a problem, you know, problematic later on. So we've got to think about this stuff up front. So 
XYZ Corporation travel vouchers are going to be found on that suspect's computer. Again, we've got to go back and, and, and show they're an employee, so we want to find those vouchers. By finding those original vouchers, altered or unaltered, what's that going to show us? It's going to give us the file types, right? We get the file types, so now we know how the originals come. We know how the originals are named. They probably have a standard, they may have a standard naming convention, for example, which can help provide us keywords to find them. Maybe they've, um, you know, maybe they change, maybe the bad guy changes the name of it based on the, the, the trip or the date or some other pattern that we can then leverage to help find other things. Maybe they don't, maybe they don't modify the, uh, or, uh, the name of the file and then modify the altered ones in a certain predictable way. Maybe, maybe they do, right? So by looking at these original vouchers, we at least get some idea of what is normal. All right, what is normal so then we can spot what's abnormal. Come on. <clears throat> Receipts supporting these vouchers will be found on the suspect's computer. So again, we want to see what normal looks like. How did they enter those original receipts? So now we know where the other ones are. The original ones are the ones that may have not have been altered. So now we can kind of get an idea of what normal looks like and what the ones that have been altered looks like. Because we're going to want to be able to prove that, right? We're going to want to show what, how this got there, the original, and what they did to it, right? So we've got to figure those out. We also know, again, the file type and the format, how they actually did it, right? A mobile device, we find some file signature in there that points us in that direction, so we can reconstruct. Unaltered receipts can be found on that suspect's computer. Again, it goes back to this whole process and the whole um, how they did what they did. So we start with this original unaltered receipt brought into the computer by some piece of technology. It could be a mobile device, it could be an office scanner, or what have you. All right. So um, next, receipts showing alteration are going to be found on the suspect's computer. So how or where would we look for this? Metadata. Metadata. Could you get more specific, maybe? Well, also, or I guess, easily, if you have the originals, you can see a change, file change date, and stuff like that. MD5 hash. Okay, MD5 hash of? The alternative. Give me your... So how are you going to find those altered receipts, though? I mean, you got to have to get, get the MD5 hash. You've got to have the hash of that file, right? So we have, you don't know that we have the submitted. You've got you've got a hash. You have the unaltered version, but how are you going to find the altered? Well, you have to find the, You've already found the originals too, right? So, so then now you just need to find the same file types that have different MD5 hashes. Or if you've done a timeline, you can see where you might have changed the timeline. Okay, timeline. I, I like that idea where you can see kind of the same window. Of you know this this file was accessed, and then what's the next thing? It was you know it's moved down the line a little bit, and that same kind of right. Okay, I like that idea real well. Good. And what did what do you have? What was your idea? Well, if you have the two MP, MD MD five hashes and you have other same file types with the same names, that don't equal it. Then it's you know potentially could be the altered. Okay. All right. Well, so what are some things, what are some forensic countermeasures that they, if, if they wanted to get, you know, the next level of bad guy sophistication, what are some forensic countermeasures you may have to try to overcome here? Password encrypt. Say again? Password encrypt files. Yeah, encrypted files. What else? Deleted files. Deleted files, okay. Is that going to be a, um, is that in and of itself going to be enough, though, with a forensic tool? Just the mere fact of deleting it? Or missing, if you like used a wipe tool. Okay, all right, a little, little bit of bleach bit on there, all right, could be. What else? Different file names or containers. Or file names, containers, how about extensions? Extensions, well, it's a, it's a container. Okay, so what, do the, do the, do the, here's a question though, do your for, forensic tools, I know NCASE and FTK, but I'm not sure about the one you're using, does it actually? It looks the headers. Headers, okay, good, all right, good, awesome. All right, software capable of altering original receipts are going to be located on that suspect's computer. Okay, how would you find that? Install programs, and where do you find those artifacts? Registry, all right, good. In the registry, all right, so we can look at maybe, um, there's a few different places you've got. What happens in the registry if, let's say, that suspect has installed that software and then removed it? 
are the registry artifacts then removed as well? Unless they clean the registry. It's still there unless they unless they unless, unless they go to that next level. Yeah, right? So even if they remove that, all right, odds are there's gonna be registry artifacts still there showing that that software was installed at some point. All right? So there you go. So then there's there's multiple places. So that's one of the things we've got going for us, is there's so many places inside of a Windows machine that their artifacts are left of user activity that the garden variety most folks have no idea this stuff is even there. And if they know it's there, they've got no idea how to get rid of it, right? So even if they get rid of one thing, they may not have gotten rid of them all. So there's multiple spots we can look. So we went for the MRU, most recently used, is another example of where we can find some artifacts of this kind of thing. Indications such software was used, all right? So again, maybe the MRU there is a good, a good, uh, a good clue to look at. We can see what files were listed in that MRU for that application. So what application was used in this scenario? Photoshop. Photoshop. So what kind of file types or file extensions are we looking for? Maybe? Dot .ps. Dot .ps? Is, that, is it the same as the PSD? I've used Photoshop in a long time. There's a couple of formats. It depends if you just save the raw format. You know, which people, you, if, if you don't know what you're doing, you probably don't. You probably just save it as a data file. All right, so then by saving the Photoshop format, you save the layers, right? Is that right? Is that yeah. right? The okay. raw, yeah. And then also the, the also is the all the path or not not the path, but all the I guess revisions perhaps changes, you yeah. can get a change. All right, so good. Yep, so that, that would be awesome if we found that. <clears throat> also if you had enterprise software in a corporate environment, you look at you know, Windows main like a SCCM or some type of uh, Application inventory, right? It should be crawling all those machines to see what applications are in all four of the machines. Okay. Oh, Without yeah. touching the machine. And possibly on your servers, because he might have actually, if he has like redirected drives, he might be accidentally saving it to a network share, not realizing that it's not on his local machine. Yeah. Happens. Absolutely yeah. happens. No doubt. No doubt about it. All right, so now I want to start drilling down a little bit into these actually uh, forensic specific questions. But let me do this. Let's take about a five or ten minute break right here, and we'll come back before we get started on this. Let me pause that a second. Uh, it's, it's just going to keep going. It'll be a break in the video. Okay. I can just let it run, or I can stop it, I guess, and we'll just have two videos, so they'll get part one, part two. Let's do that. Let's do it. Let's go.